Oh, good evening, everybody. <laughs> Seems weird to talk to such a big room. Uh, so thank you guys for coming. Um, we're here for the public information meeting and local concerns meeting for the US-3 bridge replacement project over at Babusik Brook. Um, with us here tonight, we've got Anna Giraldi and Jim Bouchard from our consultant group, uh, Quantum Construction Consultants. My name is Kyle Fox. I'm the Public Works Director in Merrimack. And we have Don Tuomala. She's the town engineer for uh, Merrimack Public Works. Uh, so the way the meeting tonight is going to go, um, I'm going to turn the mic over shortly to Jim. And he's going to talk through the process of, of the project so far. Uh, we've got a, a number of alternatives that, that were developed for the project of different ways we could could execute this, this project. And we've kind of narrowed it down to what we think is the, the best alternative. And what this meeting hopes to accomplish is to get feedback from the public to uh, get feedback on that alternative and the other alternatives to make sure that we are going in the right direction and we're getting the project that, that the town wants um, and, and, and needs. Um, Following the, uh, so Jim will do an introduction on the project. Then we're gonna have a quick PowerPoint presentation um, for, the, for the project. And afterwards, we'll invite the public up to the microphone to uh, give public testimony to the project. Um, those of you not wishing to speak um, publicly, uh, we do have some sheets of paper over there where you can uh, write down some comments after and either email them to Quantum, there's an email address on the form, or you can drop them off to my office, uh, which is in the uh, basement level of Town Hall, so if you go around to the back side. Um, also, if anyone has any questions, um, if you're watching this um, at home and, and want to ask questions about the project, feel free to either uh, email me at kfox at merrimacknh.gov, that's kfox, at merrimacknh.gov, or you can give us a call um, at Public Works. It's 424-5137. Uh, following the uh, public comment period, uh, we can uh, do some personal interactions um, at the, at the uh, poster boards to get an up-close look at the project and answer um, certainly very specific questions that, that aren't tailored towards a kind of a public uh, presentation. So. With that, I'll turn it over to Jim, and, uh, and uh, we'll get this program going. Thank you. Thanks, Kyle. The last time Anna and I played a room this big with this amount of people, we decided comedians we weren't and engineers we are. Um, Anna and I have been in Quantum for a number of years. Uh, Quantum is a small engineering firm in Concord, New Hampshire. We specialize in only doing municipal bridges and municipal roadways. Um, yeah. <laughs> We're gonna share this duty of uh, making the slides go. Um, we don't do municipal roads and 90% of what we do is municipal bridges under the state aid bridge program. So, um, we're pretty much the, you know, we consider ourselves uh, extremely knowledgeable on this and we're gonna run you folks through this program. Uh, DOT is, has a number of bureaus, like any other big bureaucrat uh, office. The one we deal with most is the Bureau of Community Planning and Assistance. They're the ones that, they are the outreach arm of DOT to the communities, to the municipalities. And part of that is they have a, a state aid bridge program that puts in about $6.8 million a year into uh, state aid bridges. Um, what that does to the, for the municipalities is that the project, the project costs, not just the construction costs, but all the project costs, the engineering, uh, surveying, wetlands, uh, all that is reimbursable for at 80%. The town puts in 20% when the project's all done. Um, it is a popular program, and they are currently looking at uh, funding cycle out at 2030. That's the next opportunity for a municipality to get in there. Thankfully, the town of Merrimack did their due diligence a long time ago, and US Route 3 is programmed for what we call fiscal year 2023, which in uh, state government means the money's become available July 1st, 2022 for construction. So 
uh, is coming right up. Um, but here's the process. Funding approval and QBS selection of consultant. Um, Q QBS, quality-based selection. The town did this a number of years ago, and that is how Quantum Consulting uh, got into the town as their town engineer. We went through the QBS process, we're selected, and we've been doing uh, bridges here in the town, helping the town out for a number of years. Um, the next step is the engineering study, which we are in. What's the engineering study? The engineering study takes a look at ex existing conditions. We do survey, we bring everything together, and we evaluate what can go in, what has to be done to take care of the bridge problem at hand. Next step is once we get through the engineering study, and to be quite honest with you, you folks, this is the last step of the engineering study, is the public informational meeting where we come out to you to gather local concerns. What are the concerns of the community relative to this project? So we have it into our bound report as we go forward. Next step is preliminary engineering, uh, which is you know plan specs and estimate, which we call affectionately call PPS and E. Once that's approved by DOT, we go down to the final plans, uh, and which is the PS and E. Uh, and then uh, at the end of ps &E, DOT says, yes, you're ready to go to bid now. You are authorized, Mr. Municipality, to take your project out to the general contracting community and get into uh, the bidding this. At that point, they will reimburse the communities 80% of all the engineering costs and municipal costs that they have incurred to date to get this ready to go into um, the, the bidding phase. Bid phase, you get your bids. You open the bids publicly, you uh, um, go through a review process, select a qualified contractor to do the work, and get approved by DOT. And at that point, once the town signs the construction contract with the contractor, the town is uh, advanced 40% of the construction costs to help them through the, the construction process. We go through with... Um, Excuse me. What's typically done, it has been done in the past, is that the consultant who did the design is also involved for the construction services, where we do the administration, review the shop drawings, have field reps out in the field, um, overseeing the process, watching the process, providing oversight. Effective this year, that has changed. DOT is now saying that the design consultant cannot do the construction oversight. It has to be another independent consultant. So the town will have to go out and select a different engineering consultant to take over the, you know, the construction services for the project. Um, and we'll, we step out of the picture. And then when everything is done, the consultant that is selected will help the town or the town does it themselves to compile the package that has to go to DOT for the final reimbursement of uh, the project costs, whatever those final costs are. And, um, and that will bring it to 80% and the town is left with only paying the 20% of the total project. So where are we? Engineering study, scoping. What do we have? What do we got? Let's go out and find out what we have. Let's establish those purpose and a need. Why, what is the purpose of the project and what is the need? Purpose of the project. The project of this is to correct the structural and uh, Hydraulic deficiencies, as we have uh, talked with other members of the community before, this bridge is, uh, was constructed many years ago. We didn't have the rain occurrences that we're having now. It is a constriction in the Babusa Brook waterway, such that under severe storms, this constriction can run all the way back up through Magaw, all the way up to Wire Road, and, and beyond. So, we have a severe problem for hydraulic efficient, you know, uh, capacity at this bridge. The other thing is, is, is the, the structural capability of it. It is, it's tired. It uh, has served its purpose, but it needs to, to be replaced. So we're in the de you know, design criteria. Here's what Anna has to deal with, more than me, because uh, she becomes our structural, she's our structural engineer, and I tend to deal with the roads. But she's got to deal with the bridge manual, the highway design manual, which is partly me. We have the standard specifications for road and bridge by DOT. We have the AASHTO, which tells us how to design the bridge. So we not only have the DOT, we got the AASHTO, which is the American Association of State and Highway of Transportation Officials. We have a manual on traffic control devices. What does a stop sign have to look like? What does a stop bar have to look like? 
Um, and then the other one I have to deal with is the geometric design of streets. How do we make the street work? Well, in new construction, that's you know, that becomes apropos. This is uh, an existing. Next thing we do is what are the existing conditions? Some of us have never seen this bridge. I gather most people in the community have not seen this bridge. They drive over every day. So what are we going to do? We're going to introduce you to your bridge and, and give everybody a good feel of what we've seen. It's a 20-foot bridge constructed in 1933. Did I say it was old and tired? Yes, it is. It has concrete spalling along the arch, the abutments. There's rebar reinforcing that concrete that's exposed and severely rusted. When that starts to rust, it contributes and has more concrete spalling. Uh, it's a 25, 20, excuse me, 28 foot wide paved bridge, um, 28 feet wide roadway, sufficient roadway. There are no sidewalks, but it's a nice roadway. It's got a nice wide roadway for trucks and everything. We do a topographic survey. We send, we, uh, we subcontract out to a uh, survey firm. They do wetlands, uh, jurisdictional boundaries. They do uh, look at for invasive species. They, you know, those are the things we don't, the plants that we don't want in this state. Uh, they identify all uh, the nasties of those. They, uh, they look for vernal pool. Is there a special little pool where unique types of frog salamanders are growing, living? Uh, utilities. We have to look at utilities. This one has a very nice three-phase power set up on the east side, downstream side of the bridge that we're going to have to deal with. Not only that, there's a gas line in the bridge, and there is a 12-inch water in Maine, and there's fiber optics. So we have a ton of stuff to deal with out there. Uh, again, as we said, concrete arch bridge, 20-foot span overall, 30 feet. Nice-looking little thing. Beautiful in 1933. Doesn't work now. We have uh, uh, severe spalling, exposed rebar, as we said, steep embankments on it. Now, there's uh, some of the property owners downstream, especially on the north side, are seeing some erosion due to the higher velocities going through this thing with the higher flows. They a lot of their ero uh, banks being erosion. We have, uh, as part of the process, this is where Anna comes in. I'm going to turn it over to Anna because she knows all about hydraulics and hydrology. So hydro the, the study of hydrology and hydraulics is the water, how much water you have that goes through the bridge and the w different water surface elevations. And like Jim said, this is a severe uh, restriction in the Babusik Brook for all the upstream bridges in town. So what we have to do, we have to determine the uh, flood events. Uh, the important ones is what we call Q50 and Q100. The Mother Day's flood was pretty much the Q100. And uh, so we also determine the water surface elevations and the water velocities. And the hydrology and hydraulics pretty much determines, and the, ge and the geometry de determines what size bridge we need. And we, uh, according, uh, according to the DUT, we need a one foot of freeboard above the Q50, and we also need to pass the Q100. And in order to determine what kind of abutments or footings, uh, we do soil borings. And this site has pretty good soils. We have glacial teals, and then we have bedrock below that. So we looked at many different bridge, bridge options. Uh, we did some, looked at something that's called an integral abutment, uh, which actually you saw on the plans here too. And that one has smaller, smaller abutments and uh, piles going down to bedrock. Bridge option two uh, has bigger abutments, but a shorter span. And then bridge options, we had three and four, where it's the same as one and two, where you have the, either the, the integral abutment with the long span, 138 foot span, or the shorter span with the bigger abutments, but they're all precasts. And the precast would make it f faster and reduce the schedule during construction, but it would also cost more. So these are the bridge, different bridge types that we did. We looked actually, I think, at nine different options. Uh, so again, we had the uh, option one, which is a 138-foot span. That's a steel a beam bridge, steel girder bridge, with the smaller integral abutments. That's almost $5 million. 
And bridge option two is a shorter span, uh, but again, the abutments are very big, so it doesn't end up being any cheaper. It actually ends up being more expensive. And that one, I think, is about yeah, $6 million. And then we looked at the bridge option three and four, which is the same as one and two, but the precast. So that would, again, reduce the schedule, but cost more. And bridge option five. So it, it, instead of having a steel girder, we looked at a concrete girder. It's called a New England. Um, yeah, I, I tend to call it New England. That's what it used to be called. It's called the Northeast bulb T. Uh, but they, this span is fairly big. It's basically at the capacity of what those beams can do. So they get very heavy, expensive to transport. So it ends, that ends up being more expensive. And then bridge option six and seven is the shorter span, again, with the New England bulb T or the New England bulb deck T. And when you have the deck T, part of the beam becomes the deck too, and then you pour the concrete over that. And, but they are also more expensive than the first option. So this is a section right through the bridge, what it would look like. So five steel girders, and sidewalks, 12-foot lanes. I think the sidewalks are six feet. And let me see if this works. Hmm. How does this work? It is on. Oh, the, ah, technology. So here, here you can see the existing arch. You see how small that is. And that's why it's such a huge restriction. And then we are going to open up to 138 feet. And this is only 20 feet. Traffic control is Jim Bob's expertise. Thank you. Thank you. Traffic control. Can't take a bridge out. We're putting traffic somewhere. Um, as the slide said, this is a big project. It's going to take some time. We're looking at 8 to 12 months. Those of you that had the experience of driving over the Bedford Road project that just finished up, it about, was about that. Um, Due to uh, some utility issues out there too, but anyway. So, we're, we're, anyway, we got to do with fit almost 14,500 cars a day to travel that road. Vehicles, mixed vehicles, trucks, tractor trailers, um, and we had to figure out what we we're going to do with the traffic. Uh, everybody knows the roadway networking around that area is not really sufficient on side streets for a uh, 15,000 vehicles a day. So we started looking at some options. Um, we started talking about, um, I thought we had that up here, but anyway, one of the options we looked at was uh, to take northbound traffic on the detour plan and keep it on a single lane detour bridge and put southbound traffic over McGaw, down wire road and around. That puts traffic trailer, tractor trailers in the neighborhood. Um, it also has you know, those that know McGaw, uh, wire road, um, it, that's a, it's a hard left turn, not a good idea. We looked at another option of maybe uh, trying to phase construction of the bridge and keep uh, one lane of traffic open on the bridge while we're doing McGaw. We also looked at another option of putting traffic off the, ro off the roadway on a temporary bridge and two lanes of traffic on that. Um, and that seemed to be the better way. So it'd be free flowing traffic on a temporary bridge. Um, roadway alignment. We look at the, what the alignment's going to do. So alignment number one we were looking at was to, um, as I was talking about the detour, was the you know, first one was the downstream, off, downstream offset alignment with phased bridge construction. Again, just maybe move a portion of the bridge downstream, make it a wider bridge, and put traffic on that, and put some southbound traffic over onto McGaw Road, Wire Road. Um, but you had some issues dealing with, you know, increased Wetland permitting, uh, you got, uh, as I mentioned before, you got a lot of extra traffic on McGaw, which was never designed for a high 
traffic roadway and it also is a neighborhood it's also tractor trailers ne negotiating cars negotiating a left-hand turn uh anybody that lives on that road would you know having to deal with traffic out there not a good idea roadway all alignment number two was to completely um build a new bridge totally offline let's go downstream of the bridge the existing bridge build a new one keep the existing bridge open so the traffic flows over that once we get everybody on the new tra on the new bridge take out the old bridge now well, sounds good but um the uh geometrics on that are, are would be tough to try to make the roadways work uh it also has longer bridge spans than what we were originally looking at for the original bridge replacement and it has a extreme um a butter problem where we're going to be t you know physically taking lands permanently taking lands moving or putting a uh, bridge closer to existing uh, residential structures re residential properties not a good idea. Roadway alignment number three, we basically said, let's keep the bridge where it is. Let's keep the alignment basically the same. Maybe a slight offset because the bridge is actually has a curve going over the bridge. Now, it's on a curve. It's hard to see sometimes, but when you look at it, it there is a little curve. If we're going to lengthen the bridge, like Anna's already talked about, we're going to go from a small bridge to 138-foot bridge. Constructability-wise, it's better to make the bridge straight make it a tangent so what we had to do was change some of the roadway alignment a little bit not by much we moved the center line about three feet put a curve in before the bridge as you come north on, uh, towards wire road and finish it after you get off the bridge so it, it gets back on to the original alignment small change three to four f and uh, three feet on the center line but what we also did was on the geometrics. Everybody knows that you come down to this bridge and you come back up a little bit. We're going to raise the bridge about four feet. Makes it a little more uh, a smoother transition for the roadway, uh, easier constructability, less impacts, and it provides a feasible traffic detour plan. So this became our recommendation and discussions with the town on the preferred alignment alternative. As I was saying before, what we were looking at was, let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, here we go. This is the temporary bridge. This, at one point, we were thinking about making that the permanent bridge. This is the, where the existing is now. The preferred alternative now is to take the existing out and put the new bridge right in here. We will build, have the, well, we're not going to build it. The contractor is going to build it as a two lane temporary detour road on site with a uh, two lane detour bridge. So traffic continues to flow on Daniel Webster this way through the project site while the project site. The contractor will loan from this area all the way to this area for, for the removal of the existing bridge and construction of the new bridge. When it's all done, all this will disappear and, dis and go away. Now, as I said previously, um, the embankment out in here is taking a hit from all the water velocities coming through here. Anna talked about how, how much velocity is. Right now, there's about 19 uh, feet per second the water flows through there at the big storms, and it causes erosion. As part of the program, program we're going to go in and stabilize this. Anybody that drives northbound can see that, you know, the sand embankment, thing, trees continuing to drop off and, you know, trying to pay a visit to the river. Well, we're going to stabilize that, but we have to get on to the, the landowners here, to, and, to, and we have to work with them on easements, restoration of lands and screening later on down the road. So when everything is done, this bridge is gone, they're not sitting here looking at, you know, uh, an inter, you know not an interstate, but the, you know, the roadway bridge that they never had before. Part of the program starts back here before Wire Road. We're going to carry it on up through, do some improvements here, bring improvements all up Twin Bridge Road, and stop right before Sal's Pizza uh, Shop up in here. The road, as we show you right now, the profile for the existing road, it drops down way down to right about there. As I said, we're going to raise it up by four feet, make it a much smoother road, a lot more vertical sight distance for people traveling here. They can, as you come through, you're going to have a lot more uh, sight distance, stopping sight distances to see actions up here at Wire Road. So that's sort of where we're going with this. Anna's nice new bridge is going to go in here with piles being driven down, and we're going to, you know, she's already mentioned restored and everything. And that will be the new center point of Daniel Webster Highway. So 
Where are we now? Here comes the, the, the fun part for us as engineers. It's the, it's the permitting process. Environmental and cultural resources. What's cultural resources? It's all looking at everything of historic nature within the whole area of uh, the, the project, like Pine and Bergs, the housing, how, in, visual impacts the housing, visual impacts to, or historic housing and the bridge structure and environmental considerations. We have to have wetlands. We're going to be disturbing wet, jurisdictional wetlands. We're going to be disturbing uh, riverbanks. So we're going to have uh, permitting for that. We're going to be disturbing more than an acre of land, contiguous land. So we're going to have to have an alteration of terrain permit. So there is a tremendous amount of permitting that gets involved with a, uh, a process like this. As I just said, yes, here we go. Dredge, dredge and fill, shoreland required, alteration train. What we have, um, we have to make sure no endangered species, no uh, threatened species will be impacted. Part of that is everybody's heard about the bat problem we've had in the uh, United States, the northern long-eared bat has been uh, decimated by you know, white nose syndrome. We have to do a, uh, an analysis, a quick analysis, through U.S. Fish and Wildlife to, uh, because there's so many trees down there as to what the impacts may be for uh, if there's any impacts to the bat colonies down there. We also have to inspect the bridge. We have to go down inside the existing bridge, look from the cracks and crevices to see if there's any bats nesting down there um, or using it for nighttime roosts. So these are some of the things we have to do for uh, the threatened species. Right away in easements, always a sensitive issue with everybody, quite understandable. Uh, the project will have Im will impact two abutters on the downstream side and three abutters on the upstream side. Uh, some of these impacts will be temporary, some of them will be permanent. Um, raising the bridge, we're going to have some, we've got to have a slope coming off the roadway and um, Rather than retaining walls, so we're probably going to take some. You're going to need to get access onto land, encumber land, for a slope easement. Um, some property owners are going to be severely impacted by the temporary bridge. We make no bones about it. It is going to be an issue for them, um, and it's going to be a uh, negotiation process. What does the project have to do to make to appease them so we can get the project to go forward, and that they are also thankful, you know, well, I won't say thankful, but they, they, they're appreciative, their concerns are heard and, and addressed. Um, and uh, we will prepare some easement plans that identify the areas on the properties. Um, the town will meet with the, the, budding, the property owners. They'll work through the town assessor's department to, uh, to establish um, uh, remuneration, reimbursement. Um, we don't expect you to donate your land to the project. DOT doesn't expect you to donate the land to the project. You need to be justly compensated for, your, for uh, the disturbances and for the hardship you're going to go forward through. So that's, that's in the process. That's further down the road. We are right now finishing the engineering study. Once we get into the design process, we can further identify how much land is really going to be truly disturbed, impacted, so the town has a better idea and the property owner has a better idea of what's going to be required. Uh, construction costs. Bridge option number one, as Anna said, this was the cheapest one. Uh, $4.978 million. Call it $5 million, folks. That's, that is um, a significant amount of money, no doubt about it. Where we are now, welcome to the public informational meeting. This is where, as we call it, the local concerns meeting, where we started at the beginning. We told you about your bridge that you didn't even know probably you had, what it looked like. We told you what we have to do to it. We told you what we're going to, you know, all the issues are going to come, come from it. And now is where we get the chance it's through this meeting to hear your concerns that we can take into the design process. And once we have all this compiled, everything you see above already goes into a nice bound report and conceptual plans like we have over here on the side table. But there's a full report that has everything that we've talked about it in written form, narrative form that can be submitted to the DOT and other agencies for their review. Um, it's, yes, it is a somewhat technical document because they're in the hydrology stuff, but there's also a lot that has to deal with it, you know, that, you know, that is very readable. But that has to be gone to DOT and approved. So, alternatives and recommendations. 138-foot steel girder bridge, exposed concrete deck. Why exposed concrete deck versus paved? Because you can watch the deck. You can keep track of the deck. You can do more maintenance on, a, uh, on the bridge 
if you can see what's happening to the concrete. This is what, we, what was designed and constructed over at Wire Road. DOT is doing more and more of this because when you put a membrane down and you pave over it, you don't know what your concrete, what's happening to your concrete deck. At least with exposed uh, concrete deck, it's, it is observable and manageable. Um, we use epoxy rebar so you don't have the corrosion. Um, it is a, there is a design process, and uh, the project that we're recommending has the smallest footprint of impact, has lowest cost, and you know the recommendation is to move forward with final design permitting and request uh, DOT permitting, <coughs> I give a reimbursement, excuse me, as we go through the design process and then be ready to start in 2023. What's that mean? Sometime in the fall of 2022, this project will be bid and bids received and so the buy and contract uh, signed with a contractor between the town and the contractor over the winter time. So come springtime of 2023, they actually start construction. They're gonna start removing trees and go forward and if everything works out good and, and things fall into place and we can hold to an eight month window come November, late October of the same year, 2023, the project is done and uh, construction's gone, you have a new bridge. Uh, what do you, yep, com we have to complete design in 2021. It is funded by the town of Merrimack and as I've already mentioned through DOT, through the Municipal Bridge Aid Program, the other acronym for it is State Aid Bridge, Progr State Aid Bridge Program. Um, US Route 3 is not a federal road. Um, therefore, we, um, the town, the bridge is, it's in the compact, it's a town road, the bridge is in the compact line, even though it's numbered, a U.S. Route 3, it is still a uh, municipal roadway. Um, it may qualify as part we, for what we call MOBAR funding, which is Municipal Off-System Bridge Replacement and Rehabilitation. That is a federal program that contributes for federal dollars to the program uh, and takes allows uh, the state dollars to stay with other bridges. Um, currently, um, yeah, it, DOT would prefer that, but currently what they have done is um, they have included this bridge into what they call the GO-22 bond, which is uh, the legislature, the state legislature has asked them to advance the, a lot of their bridges that were scattered out through 20, up through 2029, move them through, bond them, get them done, and pay off the bond. Um, that was moving forward until this little thing called COVID came around and the state legislature hasn't had a chance to really address it any further at this point than I, that we are aware of. So, what do we have for a bridge? What's this bridge gonna look like when it's done? I don't know, you want me to walk through it or you wanna run it through? All right, I'll, this is Bedford Road. For those of you who didn't, did not travel it, we had a single lane let me see. We have a single lane detour right here, alternating traffic. We had traffic signals up here, and we had traffic signals down there. Basically, we're going to have the detour road, but it's going to be two lanes right. Here are the piles that we drove on for one abutment. They've dri driven to refusal, um, coffer dams for the river. Here's the piles, as you can see, right here for, that will support the bridge. Here the port, they're preparing, they're putting the formwork in for the cast in place concrete abutment that sits on top of the piles. Um, here is the pile cap when it's all completely done, the wing walls um, and the piles. Here's the channel that's been stabilized. This is very similar to what you're gonna see at, uh, for Babusik Brook at Route 3. We get stone work to prevent scour. It's a, as Anna said, it's saw, it's gravelly sands, silts, cobbles, it erodes easily. Here's the bridge going in, steel beams being set on the concrete abutments. Uh, there they are in place. Now they're getting ready to pour the exposed concrete deck. Here's the reinforcing. They're putting in uh, the concrete screed, runs on a set of rails. Uh, the concrete has been placed. It has to be, here they're placing it. We have to keep it wet for, uh, cu for curing process. That's what you saw the, uh, the covers on, keeping it heat. This was wintertime also. So they were keeping those covers on to keep it heated. Um, here's the concrete going in through the rebar, epoxy coated rebar here on this one on some of the, uh, some of the areas. Approach slab, that's what was being formed was the approach slab with the epoxy. And the bridge has a, the stainless steel. Um, Placing the fill to match in with the approach slab, you know, building the roadway up. 
Same thing we're going to do. Built the roadway. Bridge. Here's the bridge rail uh, going on. This one has a sidewalk on it also on one side. Uh, the, but this is the bridge rail um, we have to use. It's been tested by uh, the feds. Um, more construction. Here's the road. It still hasn't been built up. or They're building it up. The detour road's over here. Um, okay, now we've got the pavement up and the concrete's in all the uh, for the for the deck. This machine is actually milling it. We start f basically flush with over at this, and we mill off a little bit. What happens is we build the 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 road is cast at <clears throat> one percent. We and we are at a, uh, a cross slope. We mill it. This milling puts my, small grooves in the surface of the deck for increased traction and for uh, getting the water off the bridge. Otherwise than that, you know, it would be a smooth uh, gymnasium floor roller skating rink, which wouldn't be good for, any, for cars in wet weather. Sort of that's where we end up. Now we're, we turn it back over to you folks for questions. There's a mic over, oops, there's a mic right over there. Um, and Anna and I, Kyle, can uh, fend questions that you may have. Some of you we've already spoken to before the meeting, but uh, you're, we welcome you to come back up, put your comments on the record as we go forward. Thank you, Jim and Anna. Um, at this point, we'd like to open it up to uh, public comment from anyone who would like to speak on the project. Uh, please come up to the microphone, identify yourself, and, um, and let us know your questions. Hi, Tom Koenig, 1 Danforth Road. Um, I'm also a member of the Town Council. I appreciate your being here and thank you for the thorough uh, review of what you're doing. What I, I, I guess I want to understand if we can start permitting in 22 in the summertime, but we won't be able to start construction until 23 in the springtime. Is that right? Or Yeah, so uh, great question, Tom. Thank you. So all of the projects we do that are either state or federal funded are programmed in the uh, NHDOT's 10-year plan. And there's three different uh, categories of funding. There's PE, which is the preliminary engineering. Uh, there's right-of-way funds. And then there's construction funds. And they can all be programmed in different fiscal years. Uh, so the PE and the right-of-way, they're always programmed at least in the same year or an earlier year. Uh, so that that we can do the project and get reimbursed in in real time for for the design phase of the project and then the big chunk of the money is always the construction piece and and so that that's the tougher piece to to get a head start on because uh, there's so much of a backlog of, of needed projects in the in the state um, so it, it's typically hard to move up on on the construction schedule because that's the big piece, but and that's the piece that's programmed for fiscal 23. But I, I saw, just help me understand, the, the engineering study will be done in 21. You're not going to even be able to put out bids until the summer of 22? Because that's, that's the start of the, the fiscal year that, that we're allowed to build? We can't bid ahead of time and be ready to go July 1, 22, or? What, what so, so two points I'll make on that. Um, first, the, the design process is arduous um, at best uh, with the, the environmental permitting and, and uh, cultural uh, resources permitting that we have to go through. Um, it, it can actually take a year or two to, to get to the, 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 uh, the plan ready stage. Um, what what we're, we're doing is we're pushing forward to get the design done. If everything goes really well and we get the plans done, DOT will then classify the project as an on-shelf project, meaning the design is done ready to bid. If another project in the 10-year plan slips, then there is a chance they could move our project up. Uh, but there's no commitment for that. The right. commitment is fiscal 23. Uh, but if everything does go well and we can get it early, uh, we'd certainly um, welcome that opportunity. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it, it looks like our best guess at this point is we would start construction work in the spring of 23 Most and it likely. would take 
through that winter, or how long would it take to, to actually build if we got started in April? Well, what we're looking at is, is, is like I say, an eight to 12 month window. And if the, the money becomes available, it will become available July 1st, 2022, you really don't want to be starting them because what happens is now, if it's an eight month to 12 month, you're, you're going to be constructing during the winter time, and we have what we call winter conditions. Everything has to be tented, heated the whole time while it's, you know, the, the, for the concrete work, which adds a lot of cost to the project. And it can also slow the project down, actually, because they have to do all this work. So what, what we try to do is um, we'll start the permitting process in preliminary engineering, get through final design, get ready to go to bid. And then when we bid it in, say October, November, December of 2022, um, because of the time frame involved for construction, eight to 12 months, this becomes a good, you know, good project for a contractor knowing that if they get this in November, they've got a big project to, that's gonna keep them occupied all next summer. Versus if they wait to start in July, if they're coming in July, they might have overlap with other projects trying to finish up. They can't start July 1st and stuff, but this gives them the ability to, okay, soon as they can get on the ground, tree cutting, tree removal, things like this in April, March even, get ahead of the game. They have a nice con one construction season to do the project in. So does, it's that a better. does that construction season include removing the temporary bridge? Yes. Okay. That, it, it will, but the idea is get the bridge built first, and, and which what we call substantial completion. What is that substantial completion? The new bridge is built. Traffic is on the new bridge. Uh, it is up and running. And now from substantial completion to final completion, that is the time period where they remove the temporary road. They do the temporary uh, the te temporary road. Temporary bridge goes away. They do um, the slope stabilization, as we've noted for, uh, for a couple of the landowners. They do uh, restoration, plantings, uh, fences, what may be required for screening, that's done in that period. So basically we look at eight to 12 months to get the bridge in and then the rest of it goes on, uh, could extend the project, you know, the, the whole project might be 16 months depending on what happens in the wintertime, but it's not impacting traffic. It's the right. cleanup area. Okay, but even if you started in April or so, you're gonna be November, December by the time you're completing the the main bridge yes. and getting traffic on it and so, any any um, any natural regrowth or whatever you're putting back into the banks when you take out the temporary is obviously going to wait till spring or summer that of is, next year. That is correct. To we'll do any planting. I or. mean, it depends on how uh, you know how efficient the contractors are. Some of these contractors can schedule this right up they, and they work right on it, get it going, um, and it is overall it's not a difficult thing. It's the utilities we have to deal with. Um, uh, gas line, you got to keep the, the, ga the water main can't be uh, shut down. It has to be kept open. We have to have temporary supports for that, or put you know put a temporary water main in while you put you know take out the one that's in existence. Things like that have to be staged in that affect um, the timelines for the bridges and and getting this back out. But the idea is get the bridge built in one construction season. That includes all the utilities that have to be dealt with. Then if it has to carry on to get into the restoration to the next summer, uh, you know, that's something we have to, that's something we have to look at. We have a better idea as we get going, start going forward into the design process. And is, is there a gas line in that bridge also, or just a water line? Pardon? Yes, there is a gas line out on the bridge right now. Okay. Um, and we've been, uh, early discussions with Liberty Utilities, they are, they know about it, they're willing to, you know, they, they're ready to work with us. They, possibly might even upgrade it a little bit, but uh, we did discussions with them a year ago, and uh, we'll, that will be picked up again once we get into the design phase. Okay, great. Well, I, I very much appreciate what you've presented, and I agree with what I heard as the uh, preferred alternative, uh, putting in a full bypass around it. I know that's going to disturb a lot of vegetation and a lot of shoreland around that area, so as you said, it requires alteration of terrain and everything else, but um, the alternative of going over McGaw Bridge doesn't sound very impressive. No. And uh, going all the way around would be worse. So um, thank you for the efforts you're doing, and uh, I, I encourage you to go forward. Anything we can do to help, by all means, let us know uh, from the town perspective. I'm sure you're constantly in contact with Kyle and, and uh, working that issue from DPW's perspective. So thank you very much right. for all Excellent. of your thank efforts. You. Would anyone else care to speak?
I know we're not going to stop this project. That's that's out of the question. We're not stopping the stopping this project. So, needless to say, you're going to use my land. That's what you're coming up to. Is my land. No, I shut it off. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it just we'll get, get together later on and find out exactly what we got to do to make everybody happy on this. I mean, we got we've got privacy now. We want privacy when it's done. That's yep. all. You know, that's the big thing. And of course, you're going to come quite a ways on my land. Right. So that's going to be a big, big issue there too. Yeah, so the, the question relates to a butter impacts. Um, yeah. So the way that process will work, um, the, the, the program that the state uses on the, the shared funding projects, um, and this state is eight, the, this project is funded 80% by the state, 20% by the town. Um, so we have to follow what's called an LPA process, local public agency process, mandated by DOT and and above them federal highway so there there's steps we have to take and what so what the the abutter impact steps are is once we've compiled all of the responses from this public information meeting um, all of that data all all of our preferred alternative will be submitted to the state for their review and to the cultural resources folks that's the historic folks uh, the environmental folks um, archaeological all of those kind of agencies, they'll give their initial review on the project. Once they give us the go ahead and agree that preferred, uh, the preferred option that we submitted is indeed the preferential one that they'd like us to proceed with, right. um, the, the state will give the town a notice to proceed into uh, the preliminary engineering phase, the next phase of design, uh, the final design phase. So that then quantum will take over from there. Um, They've already got the existing condition plans. They'll, we've got preliminary set of plans. They're gonna develop a more robust set of plans. And one of those plan sheets is gonna be right of way impacts or, or a butter impacts. And um, at that point, uh, members from the town, most likely Don and I will uh, work with the assessor to figure out the square footage of impact and whether it's a temporary impact or a permanent impact um, the, the assessor will give us a, a recommended range of values uh, that that impact is worth. Um, then we'll go to the town council to get permission to negotiate with the, the abutters. And then finally, we, we will send out a, what's called an offer letter. Um, and the offer letter, and again, it, it, it seems all very formal, but it's for a reason. It's to protect the, the landowners. Uh, so you'll re receive a, a formal offer letter of compensation. Mm -hmm. At that point, we can have a dialogue about further concerns, um, particularly in, in your case where so much tree, tree uh, yeah, buffer is going to be removed. Yeah. Um, and we can have that, that discussion and, and negotiate um, and hopefully come to terms on what we both feel is fair compensation for uh, the, the, the easements both permanent and temporary, and the permanent impacts with trees and, and what we can do for plantings on the project and, and whatnot. Uh, once we finalize all of that negotiation, it'll culminate in a, a signing of easement documents. The temporary easement documents will just stay with the project. The permanent um, easements, if there are any, will actually be recorded at the Registry of Deeds in. Uh, in Nashua, the oh, yeah. Hillsborough County Registry of Deeds. Um, so that's kind of how the process goes. We're a little ways away from there, yeah. uh, but it will be coming as one, once we get the go ahead from DOT to enter the final design process and we can lay out where the, one, once we know the exact limits of the well, project. Well, you know, like I said, we'll, we'll have to get together later on this anyways and you know, talk about all the impact and all that on it. Yeah, absolutely. So. And and although our preference may be to begin that communication now, um, um, we I mean, we really can't get into formal right. discussions on it. 
until until the DOT has given us the go-ahead right. uh, because it's their money, so we have to follow their rules. Okay, I have another question. I wasn't thinking you, about the trees that are going to be going. The trees are going to be going quite early in the project, correct? Correct. So, is there any possibility of getting a temporary fence up? So those privacy? are things we can look at through the design process. Um, Definitely, um, now that you've brought it up, we, it, it's something we'll definitely look into, and maybe we can provide some sort of temporary screening throughout the project. And that's certainly something Jim and Anna can look at. Um, that's happened on other projects where you can put in a temporary fence with some like black sheeting or something on it. Yeah. We, we can look at those kind of options. We, we can evaluate, um, you know, maybe it's, maybe it's a little more formal than that, and actually put up a wooden fence you know, eight foot high or something like that. So it gives us some room for to work on the embankment, but it keeps you screened away from, you know, the activity and see it. And then that, that could stay with the project and, tr and still put the plantings on the other side. These are things that can get talked out as we go yeah. down the road. Yeah, um, but, but uh, my concern is you're going to put that fencing up right away for our privacy. Yeah, no, Once I, you take the trees down. No, no. We, yes. and, and, and fully understand, and, 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 to be, and to be honest with you, if I, was, if I were in your shoes, that's what I'd be requesting too. So, yeah, that's, but as Kyle said, things, it's in our head now. We know about it. We know your concerns. It's going to be documented in, for tonight's meeting already, and we'll go forward and, and say, we have an abutter that has already vo voiced their concerns. This is what we're going to be dealing with. And... And, and, and the town and quantum can put a uniform approach to the DOT that we have to ha we have to do this. It's a significant impact to your to your lands. Okay. All right. Sounds good. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? Yeah. <laughs> well, I guess with that, we'll close the uh, public hearing uh, portion of this session, um, and we'll actually close the session out. Anyone wanting to get a closer look at the, the uh, display elements um, that are behind us are welcome to. Um, we just ask you to put your masks back on and we can have a uh, more detailed conversation. Um, with that, I'll thank Jim and Anna, thank all of you guys for coming out and uh, have a great night. <laughs>